sloppy yeah now we got that one on tape as well then we can release it uh... i'm sloppy i i i uh, you know what it is it's one of those things where you learn how to play something and then you, yeah. you think you're good you think you're getting All right good. then you play in front of someone <laughs> yes and, I, we have it on tape now so i will have you can't put it do, up. and you can't do it the same way yeah i can't no 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 i can put it up on illegally now on youtube so all you you co-fans will yeah. have it and listen to it afterwards Thanks for having me. We have a bit of a struggle before we came here together, but now we are on are online. And we um, laughed, we've cried. Yeah, we laughed, we cried, and we were angry at each other and, and shouted because, yes. because our glasses are uh, not so good with the uh, lights and everything. We're getting old, Jude. That's where are I'm you, Par? I'm in Sweden. And it's dark, and it's getting more and more dark. Have you been in Sweden? Yes, many times. Why? Well, touring, touring with uh, Moon Martin. We used to go all the time. Yeah, yeah, in the early, in, in I've, late seventies. I've been there with. Um, <clears throat> I was there on my own as well, but. Uh, Did you go here? What uh, in the late eighties, early nineties? I don't remember the last time I've been to Stockholm. I think it's a, Stockholm is the only city to Sweden I've been, but uh, it was always one of my favorites too. You know, it was one of those bittersweet things. Like I wanted to know it better, but it was so far and so very little excuses to ever go there. Yeah. Um, I had an opportunity once with a good friend who wanted me to come over and uh, produce a band but for some it didn't transpire for some reason and, what, what uh, band was, do you remember that no i don't I, it was just a a friend from a record company he worked for emi and he okay. wanted me to come was over it sven and, Oke from yes. EMI. oh i used to work at emi and he's a good friend of mine uh sven was a lovely guy and, yeah. and really i you know always he was a he was a beautiful guy from what i remember in the 70s like he was i remember like I remember coming to Sweden where you... you <laughs> this is personal <laughs> stuff for everyone who's watching now. It's personal stuff we're going into, you and I, but you have to hear this. So, yeah, go on. Well, I, in Sweden in those days, I remember, you know, my first impressions of Sweden. It was like, is there anyone ugly in this country? Because everyone was just so beautiful. Even I the guys ugly. were beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> You, you know, uh, even uh, Sven at EMI, uh, we're talking about the friend uh, mute, uh, that we have, both of us. He did a Moon Martin Best Of album in Sweden. Which album? A Moon Martin Best Of album. Uh -huh. Because he is a big fan. Yeah, Moon did pretty well over there. I'll tell you, one, one story from Sweden that was just magic was... Um, they they uh, invited us over to ABBA Studios. Oh, so you their, went there to hear their newest, latest recording that had not been released yet. They had just finished a mix on Super Trooper. Super Trooper. And I went into the studio and mm -hmm. I heard this mix of Super Trooper. If you can imagine, I mean, this was 1980. Yeah. And I had never heard anything like that in my life. No. So, ba -ba, ba -ba, coming out of stereo with the, with yeah. the uh, you know very very syn synchronized beats sounded yeah. computerized almost at the time. It wasn't you know it was played, but uh, I wow, know. those guys were fucking were, talented. It was so good. Yeah. They're so Just, talented, these guys. Do you know that they are releasing new stuff on Friday? That's awesome. Yeah, I had heard something about that. No one knows what it is. Uh, obviously, they know, but uh, their fans doesn't know anything. Uh, they're talking about two new songs. I heard. So we we'll see what. Whenever happens. I see a, an interview with Anna, I, I always will 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 view it. You know, um, she's such a, a mystery to me and such a classy woman. Like she's the the uh, quintessential like female. Uh, 
maybe a bombshell when she was younger, but she just grew up to be an elegant, uh, uh, classy lady. Yeah. I really admire her very much. Yeah. Uh, Do you have another favorite Swedish artist, by the way, before we start talking about your excellent career? <laughs> well, I don't know a lot of Swedish artists. And, and the, those that I do know probably don't even know they're Swedish. Um, I, it's funny though, because I've been listening to a guy lately that I listened to a long time ago as well. And this a guitar player named uh, Jan uh, Ackerman. No. He's, he's Dutch. Not Jan Ackerman. No. Huh? I think Jan Ackerman is Dutch, isn't he? Hold on a second. Yeah, I want to or see. is it Ackerman? Um, I, 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 sometimes I forget his last name. Hold on a second. Yeah. I got to find this out now. No problem. Uh, I, can, I can show people so beautiful good. sleeves in the main time here. Jan Schaefer. Oh, all right. Do you remember him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you listen yeah. to him. <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where his record was playing when I first moved to California. And I'm like, who is this? Okay. And he had this record, I think it was called Happy Feet or something. And uh, I, I still put talking, it on. I think, now we're I think because stuff. it reminds me of, excuse me? Now we're talking deep stuff here. This is not. Yeah. Very, very <laughs> who, who's, uh, who's really happening in Sweden now as a, as a Swedish artist? Uh, there is a lot. You know, um, we have... Um, Max Martin, obviously, who is the um, biggest songwriter in the world for the moment. I think he had uh, the most number ones on the Billboard chart ever. He even, he had more than um, the Beatles guys these days. And yeah, the, 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 the music- uh, the most successful writer that ever lived. Yeah. No, but- and, it, and, and so fascinating to see from my earliest um, knowledge of him when he was, just starting out and they did those ace of base i think the ace of base uh, records yeah exactly um and to watch his growth since then it's just yeah, been it's amazing uh going from that to the weekend you know it's um he has such a wide range and uh bon is the weekend swedish no 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 no, no. Oh. uh in sweden right now there isn't many bands that are uh, well known abroad i think uh, you know if i mention name a girl like sara larson she's not famous as an artist all over the world even if she streamed one billion times you know it's uh, it's not like it used to be mm -hmm. in that sense there is a band called ghost that have been around the world uh, yeah i know in, ghost yeah they are swedish and uh They've made some pretty great videos. Yeah, amazing. They're kind of known for their videos, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they are. So there is a lot of, but the music scene in Sweden is uh, very healthy for the moment. And there is a bunch of uh, excellent songwriters doing so well uh, all over the place. Now I see your, your, your plaques behind you. Like, mm -hmm. so uh, is that from journalism? No, it's actually from my time at DMI and Virgin. So oh, that's um, right. I used to, uh, do compilation and uh, a r stuff uh, back back in the Were you with emi when i was in moon martin no uh i was uh, starting at virgin in the in the in the 90s and before that um, i'm a bit younger than sven even if we are looking the the same old age <laughs> well sven's a little older than i am so yeah. yeah yeah how old are you you're born in i'm 61 i was born 61. in 1960 but you were uh, you were starting quite early with your uh, music career. Yeah, I I, I was really uh, I, I had nothing else to do. I had to leave my hometown because I I couldn't get a job. Okay. Um, I didn't have any qualifications. I didn't graduate high school. You had to um, get on at one of the plants where I came from. You know, it was a very blue collar where town, and they built uh, combines. Where is it? The where is it in the U.S. Um, it's in Illinois. It's called the Quad Cities. And basically what funded the town were combines, you know, these big tractors, that the agricultural tractors and things. Mm -hmm. John Deere and International Harvester were both uh, from the Quad Cities, Moline, Illinois, Davenport, Iowa, mm -hmm. and, the, and there are two other towns there. Anyway, um, I couldn't get on at any of those factories. 
And that meant you wouldn't probably have a house. No. I wanted to play music. And so I just uh, had a buddy in Los Angeles and I said, you know, can I come and visit you for a month and I'll pay you rent? I just want to see what California is like. Yeah. And um, his name was Joe Solis. He's a very good friend of mine. And he was, uh, he belonged to a thing called the Musician's Contact Service. Okay. And they were looking for a guitar player that could sing. And so he said, well, I don't sing, but my buddy does. Now this is while I'm just visiting California. And the next thing I know, I'm in Moon Martin's band. So that was your first gig, actually. Not even a month in California, and I had joined this band on Capitol Records, my first gig. Okay. And then after that, it was the records. In between that, yeah. I took a hiatus and I joined the records for a while. Um, and then I went back to Moon a little later. But uh, we used to travel to Sweden three times a year. Yeah. And I remember... Um, the record company dinners were always the highlight, you know, the record company, we would go, we, we would go and then, you know, someone like Sven would have, uh, you know, or, or uh, Lothar in the uh, Hamburg. Um, Lothar. Uh, they would have their favorite restaurants and we would go. And, and I was 18 years old and I would go to these restaurants and they'd have a first course, they'd have a coffee and then they'd have a, a starter and then they'd have another coffee. <laughs> and then they have the main course, then they'd have another coffee, then the dessert, and then they'd have another like a drink. And, uh, and it was like, you know, the food was just insanely good. But yeah. at 18 years old to make me sit at dinner for three hours or four hours, I was just like, oh and my God, it got, it got to be finally where I would be asking Moon, like, do you mind if I don't go and I'm just going to go to McDonald's? <laughs> and see all the beautiful girls sitting there drinking coffee. Swedish girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you are you married these days? Uh, I have a girlfriend uh, that uh, will be ten years anniversary in just a few days. Okay. And you, but you have two kids from uh, an earlier marriage. Yeah. Two kids. Are they? Are, are they into mother music? Lori is still very much in my life as well. We're all oh. a very close knit family still, but. Uh, are they um, or into music? Are they playing music? Uh, no, my son Jesse does work with me on some things. Uh, he's kind of into the whole digital audio workstation thing. And so he does a lot of that. And then, uh, no, my other son works at a uh, designer, a clothing designer named Amiri. Mm -hmm. and, and they are based in LA with you. So you're yes. close to them. All right. Okay. Uh, if we should talk a little about is it okay if I talk also about your old career as well uh, and not only the new album? Do you have time talk to- talk about anything you want, Bar. All right, thanks. Because I also, uh, I also wrote to the, do you know there is, there is a lot of fans. Uh, actually, if you go into Spotify, I'm jumping like this now, and see where your fans are listening to your stuff, it, uh, Stockholm is number three. Of really? All city, of all cities, yes. Hmm. I don't know if there's one person listening all the time or if it's a lot of them, but uh, your number three in the world is Stockholm. You know, you were quite uh, quite famous here, known here in Sweden. There's a lot of people who, I think they did quite a good job, actually, the record company in the early 90s with, hmm. your, with your albums here. Yeah, that would be, a, it would have been a, it's so fun to come back. And, and be able to do shows there, but uh, yeah, I never did do that. No, it's uh, I wasn't much of a traveler. Yeah, but um, because I asked a few if, if, if the, uh, people in the group called You Cole fans if they had any questions, and uh, I promised them I I would um, I would ask some questions as well if it's okay with you, and uh, I think it is because you seem to be a very nice person. And this guy called Brandon Bird, he has a great question, actually, and it's a very nerdy question. Is nerd? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's written on the Telecaster Jude's holding in his picture on a view from a Third Street album? That's a good one, isn't it? Those were the musicians that played on the album. So Lee Sklar is on there and uh, Jeff Beccaro, Jim Keltner. There you got uh, your answer. So they wrote well, their names on it. 
Yeah, and now I've just recently taken that body with those signatures and I put a, it was a Squire Telly. So yeah. It was like, back in those days, you know, I didn't have a lot of guitars back then. And so I let everybody write on one I didn't play on, you know, so okay. I, they played on the Squire, they wrote on the Squire Telly. Now I've just put this new custom built uh, Fender neck on there and I'm, I'm probably going to break that thing out and put some nice pickups in it and actually play it. Because... Uh... Uh, there is, if you look at these albums from from uh, from the start to car and the view from amazing amazing uh, musicians you are working with on these albums, it's uh, it's unbelievable to see. It had it must have been such a joy to work with, for example, Jeff Porcaro. And uh, it was a very strong presence. Yeah, it, presence is the word. I, you're, um, you know, it's um. And these producers, uh, for example, David Tyson, why did you start working with him? Was it your idea or was it the A&R people idea to work with him? Well, my first album was Russ Teitelman and he was such yeah. a genius that I thought, well, I can't miss with Russ. No, it was Peter Sikera's idea to have you online uh, with Warner or? Uh, Excuse was, me? Was, I, I read somewhere that Peter Sikera was involved with your signing there, wasn't he? Peter Cetera got me my record deal, as well as Camelia Calf. Okay. Camelia was the was married to Terry, Mary, of course. Yeah. She was a friend of mine. She took the tape to Peter, and Peter took it to Michael Austin. Okay. And Michael played it for his AR team, yeah. Russ Edelman, what's you know, all those. Yeah, guys. Russ was involved in that. Uh, and Russ was the one who yeah. said, I think this guy's great. I think we should sign him and I'll produce it. Yeah. And so he did and they did and the record didn't really sell or do anything. Um, the next record, I kind of wanted to work with a keyboard player because mm -hmm. as good as Russ was, I had ideas that couldn't be facilitated by my limited guitar playing. No. And I really wanted, I love working with keyboardists. So yeah. I worked with David on that record. I worked with James Newton Howard on the following record. Exactly. Two and I always love working with uh, So it's your people. choices uh, of producers, right? Both David yes. and James, all right. Because uh, James was quite, uh, he was not into uh, producing so much records in the early nineties. He was more into writing scores for uh, films and stuff. So that was uh, when well, I- Well, I went to my uh, record company one day and I was telling Michael Austin, you know, I heard a soundtrack and I just identified with the music so much. It was almost like if I could write something, that's what I would write. And he said, what was it? I said, it was a, a soundtrack by James Newton Howard. He said, oh, well, James is a good friend of mine. I went, well, that's amazing. That's cool. He said, well, you want me to play him some of your music? And I went, of course, sure. And thinking that nothing would come out of it. And uh, shortly thereafter, he called me and he said, James, would like to meet you. And so we met and uh, funny enough, I just had dinner with James um, a couple of weeks ago. So we're still friends. Is your friends still friends? Yeah. He's a lovely, lovely guy. But more than that, he's he's just so frighteningly, frighteningly talented. It <laughs> kind of pisses me off. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's one of those musicians. He has perfect pitch. And uh, yeah. he's uh, he's um, do you remember what? Um, soundtrack it was that you were so impressed with yeah it was um i think it was called promised land it was Kiefer's. i had been to Kiefer's uh Kiefer sutherland's uh screening for promised land okay so you were very, done very with Kiefer so that early he, he was not coming into your life later yeah Kiefer and i have been friends Kiefer and i were friends for many years they're over 30 years okay so because i was uh, I was thinking about talking about him a bit later about your collaboration, but then you told me that right now. I'm looking at all the albums here. Um, you know, for me, this is you start the car and the view from it. I, you know, I'm talking to one of my top three guys, so that's why I'm a, I'm a little starstruck here. Um, mm -hmm. You. Uh, and the other guy, one of out of three, that is uh, also 
I saw a little leaf leaflet once that you were playing on the same as, uh, as Kevin Gilbert. And Kevin, we all know his tragic history right now. Uh, did you know Ma uh, Did you know Kevin? I did. Yeah, Kevin came and played on. Uh... He played on a song with, I still have the track. I never finished the song. It was called Wicked World. Oh, man. And um, he played yeah. on it along with um, Pat Mastelotto, Billy Payne from Little Feet. And um, I don't remember. I don't is, this, is this in your world? Do you have that? Yes. Oh man, I, I do have it, and the the, the astounding thing I'll, I'll play it. I'll, I'll send you a copy of it sometime. It's just a track; it doesn't have my voice on it. But the reason to listen to it is not really because Kevin Gilbert's on it, because Kevin Gilbert's just doing a, a very simple um, Wurlitzer part. Mm -hmm. But it's it's Bill Payne's piano solo. That's oh, he's the amazing feature well, thing in know. this track. The featured instrument in this track is certainly Billy Payne's solo. He was. He was so good. He is so good. Were you just uh, you, were you just involved with, with each other to write songs, or did you think about doing something together with Kevin? Yeah. No, in fact, Kevin was one of those guys that I met that I I really liked him because I really liked what I heard, and I could tell that he was he was really influenced by progressive music, and I had always loved progressive music with Yes and Pink Floyd and all yeah. that. I could tell he came from that world. Yeah. And when I met him, it was a very strange, like I liked him and I think he liked me, but there was almost this little bit of rivalry feeling in the room. Okay. Um, and I remember kind of like going like, I was happy he had come to my session, but I didn't think that I would maybe ask him back because I didn't like that energy in the room okay there's no hard feelings on him no, no 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 i just i just recognized it to be kind of like almost uh, two alphas in a room or or you know something like it didn't work no it didn't work for the room no 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 i'm very sensitive and, to that and uh, oh he's he's an artist i can tell you know it's um yeah, yeah. well and, and 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 not to blame it on him I'm, you know it takes two yeah yeah, it takes and, two. It's and now you're two. working with his uh, sidekick uh, from the Toy Matinee era, Pat Leonard, on your new album. Uh, who? Pat Leonard. Don't you work oh, with Pat him? Leonard? Yeah. yeah. Pat, Pat, Leonard. Pat, Leonard. That's why. Patrick has. Um, Patrick's been a good friend for many years now. I did uh, Jules record with yeah. him. I was a. Uh, I was kind of Jules' hands. Um, I. You know, they had me put her plastic nails they, I, they go get my nails done and get female nails put on my hands so that i could finger pick the guitar like hers and then i had to almost relearn the guitar because you know my you're not joking are, you're not joking now it i'm not joking <laughs> i'm not joking if you look at the record uh, spirit i did all the guitar work or most all the guitar work okay acoustic guitar work on that record because she played those songs well but she didn't know how to play in time very well. And Pat was frustrated that he could never get her to lock in with the click. So he was like, okay, Jude, I want you to learn how she's doing this and what her style is, and then redo it in time. <laughs> Does she think she's playing on it? No, she was with me the whole time. Okay. Because so she had to show me how to play it. So you're not the ghost guitar player on that one. No. And my contribution, real contribution to that record was really the only hit single she had was a song that Pat had played me that was very ethereal. Mm -hmm. And I and I was the one that said, man, give me my acoustic. Look, why don't you guys try like a Neil Young, like, you know, I wanted this. Uh... So when you listen to Hands, mm -hmm. it's got that Neil thing, and that's the way they did it. And... Um, you know, you don't get credited for things like that, but but that had a lot to do with the sound of that record. That's a shame, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, songwriting goes back to vaudeville days. You know, the guy who wrote the music and the guy that wrote the, the or female who wrote the lyrics get the songwriting credit. Yeah. Uh, all the other inspirations and said session musicians who came up with, you know, you think about those guys that were in the wrecking crew. Um, yeah. Exactly. Uh, How much they uh, they uh, should get oh, more credit. Yeah. That's, oh, that's, there are the hooks that came yeah. out of those guitar lines. Yeah. And uh, it's just, you know, yeah. all of it. Really, um, uh, it, 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 the, the, the fact that the that the fact that songwriting credits were kind of established through the vaudevillian days is an antiquated. Now kids are doing it much better, you know. And I see you know guys like Rick Beato on his website are going like, "Does it really take seven writers on all these songs?" It's like, no, they do that to share the you know because they're all contribute. They're all in the room. Yeah, exactly. And they contribute. I think that's a really you know, wonderful yeah. thing they're doing with producing. They'll have five producers on the song and, you know, 10 writers. And um, that's where any money is. Yeah, it is these days. It, um, <clears throat> There's no money for an artist anywhere else other than playing live. Uh, uh, speaking about uh, the music industry, um, we, have, uh, we have been discussing this before uh, a few years back, I think, uh, because you were... I don't know if I should use these words, but pissed on Spotify and these places. And we had some discussions and and obviously the new album isn't available physical yet. It's only available online. Yeah, I won't and make it physical. Why? Uh, there's no reason for it. It, it, it will sit in, trunk, in a trunk somewhere. I, I'll order if I ordered a couple of thousands of them, let's say, yeah. um, 200 of them would sell and the other 1800 would be in a trunk in my shipping container, in my mm -hmm. property somewhere. And that's the truth. You probably would sell a couple of thousand, but I understand your point of view. It's a uh, it's ridiculous amount of, uh, of uh, CDs selling these days. So yeah. I fought the good fight bar. I tried to warn everyone. This is a glass jar. Yeah. This is a glass jar with a short ceiling. Yeah. And you know, you've been so, you've been uh, uh, as a manager as well. You have seen uh, a lot of different uh, places on the, in this industry. Uh, if we're speaking uh, songwriting before first, what do you think? Uh, do you like the way uh, publishers work these days, or is publishers something you need as a songwriter? today you do if you want to get your songs placed the transition was in the in the 90s um, as radio stations continued to uh, I'm sorry my dog is no, playing no. with a toy down here <laughs> um, but as as things kind of lassoed in and, and became much smaller. All the record companies turned into three record companies. All the radio stations were bought by a few companies. So the consolidation of all of this was something that was happening. Mm. And then you would hear this word a lot. Well, we like the synergy. Uh, oh, let's, let's have uh, some synergy here. Meaning that the Warner record company really would prefer if you did a cover of a Warner owned yeah. copyright yeah. and you know Warner television shows like to use Warner artists and that kind of thing it wasn't exclusive but it was preferred yeah. and so um, that is compounded now <clears throat> to there's no more synergy because there doesn't need to be uh, there's only three companies and they all have synergy together. They're yeah. worldwide companies and um, you're either with them or you're not going to get probably anything. Are you still uh, signed to a, uh, to a publisher? Well, I'm signed to a, pri a publisher, but he's a small publisher that doesn't really solicit my material. Okay. Um, no, I got, I own my own publishing. Mm -hmm. I'm signed to an administrator, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm an owner guy. I, you know, everybody's been doing these acquisition deals, meaning they sell their catalogs 
yeah. like Bob Dylan just did and Neil Young and so on. The cobalt, he's the cobalt uh, uh, thing is very, very, um, it's unbelievable actually what they're doing with their money, with so much money. But, yeah, well, cobalt's been a very successful company and yeah. uh, another Swede, you know, these, these fucking Swedes, yeah. They come and take over on everything, right? <laughs> God bless them. You know, the, it's the Swedish understood pop music back when they were guilty pleasures for me in the 80s. I remember I was listening to ABBA records when I almost had to listen to them privately, you know, yeah. like, you know, when the police were big and all of that stuff, you didn't really, nobody wanted to hear about ABBA for a minute. But uh, uh, you know what? First, uh, the first understood. single that was number one in the US from a Swede, Swedish artist. I'll, I'm, I'm gonna guess. Number one, first song from Sweden. My guess would be Venus. Nope, it's um. Or were they Huga Swedish? Chaga, Huga 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 Chaga with Blue Swede. It was number one in the U.S. So maybe Venus wasn't. Uh, so that was the '70s. So Venus wasn't a Swedish band. Nope, they weren't. Shocking Blue. Nope, they were from Holland. 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 Yeah, that was a good record, that, though. Yeah, a very lot of harmony vocals. I still like listening to that record. Yeah. Um, speaking about the before we are coming into the new album, uh, which one of the old albums from the uh, major label era do you prefer yourself the most? The which one of them? Of mine. Yeah. When you listen to them, which one do you think is uh, keeping the best sound from the history, so to say? Which one do you think is, uh, if you you have a favorite? I think they all have their merits. I'm not very fond of my first record. No. No. I, was it too? Uh, I don't think it was mixed well. I don't think polished. it was mastered well. Too polished. Excuse me. Was it too polished? Pol pol uh, we, uh, too, well. Uh, you have to remember it was 1986 when I made that record. So a lot of Russ's instincts were to get Jimmy Braylauer in to do the drum machine track and then have Mickey Curry play over the drum machine track along with the drum machine track. And so you'd have these triggers like, but everything was kind of like a little metronomic. Yeah. There is a, I don't remember the song name in the head right now. Um, there is a ballad on that album that is very, very beautiful, though. It's uh, uh, one of the ballads that still still On my record? In, yeah, on that record. Uh, probably You Were In My Heart. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a really beautiful album, song. And speaking about after these albums, you did this one. The uh, I Don't Know Why I Act This Way. And you start working with Kevin Killen and Ron Aniello. And it became a little bit more uh, low key and uh, not so much Midwest, Midwestern rock. Yeah. What? Well, you know, um, uh, Nirvana had come out. Yep. Pearl Jam. Yep. If you weren't doing that, you were going to have a futile go of it. Yeah. And I knew that making another view from Third Street was not going to work. No. At least that's what I felt strongly about at the time. Yeah. I was also listening to a lot of Paul Simon and Randy Newman and those kinds of artists. And so I was really influenced by the fact that those records seem to have the artist in the center and any of the uh, musicianship was on the outer ring of, of, of the, what, what I felt was the center, like Randy Newman's piano and voice were at the center of all of his songs. James Taylor and his guitar were at the center of all the songs. Paul Simon and his guitar were at the center of all those songs. And I tried to really emulate that in, in that record. Yeah. No, it's a great record as well. Uh, even if it doesn't sound, it's another era from for you. Yes, but uh, it's a good album. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an era that came and went so quickly. I, I barely remember it, you know, because um, I was on Warner Brothers for the prior records and then my manager was upset with Warner Brothers that they didn't make me a bigger star and 
he pulled me off Warner Brothers, took me over to Ireland, mm -hmm. and then he died. Okay. He died. He died before I got signed to Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, I managed to work out a deal with Ireland, but Chris Blackwell was never a fan of mine, and I think Chris Blackwell asked the president to get rid of me. It's a it's a pity with all these major labels and big labels that uh, if someone ends working, you know, you're getting in between people. It's uh, so, so frustrating. I don't think people ever understood what a boys club it really was. Can, was you, ima club. can you imagine how many great albums there is in the world that never been released because of pissed off A&R guys and pissed off uh, uh, wise presidents uh, and all this laying around, you know, albums with great artists. I'm going to tell you that I was in, in, in an A&R man's office. He was the head of an A&R company on a major label. I was in his office one day. This is no BS. And he was on the phone with one of their promising new signings. And he was producing their record. And they wanted to do something. I don't. This is a long, quite a long time ago. And he, they wanted to do something different than he wanted them to do. And he said, well, I'm hearing only one side of the conversation, but he says, uh, yeah, are you sure you, you really want to do that, huh? Because I, I mean, I've told you a couple of times, like, I'm, I didn't, that's not my instinct and I don't want to go that way, but you really feel strongly about it, huh? Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'll talk to you later. Hang up the phone. He goes, they're off the label. Oh, man. And I don't think people realize what a boys club that it's always been. I, I can't say it's a boys club now no. because there's a lot of females involved. But in those days, oh, I, should, I hate that word or that term in those days. But, you know, no, from, I, the, from the time I've been in the business up until about 2000 and something, it was a boys club. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. And uh, that's that's better these days when you can do all, all your stuff yourself and get out in the world with it. Well, the most interesting story I found was Billie Eilish because Billie Eilish seemed to have done it herself. Her brother and she somehow managed to climb up SoundCloud yeah. and then climb up Spotify to where she didn't even need a deal. No. So why she decided to go with Universal is just astounding to me because not nothing against Universal, but she could have pioneered a whole new tra trajectory of, of how to make it as a music. Yeah. And she didn't, she, she sold it. I think they cry though, when they wrote the contract because I think she has a good contract, but still I, I agree with you. you, she well, you know, her contract was sensational, yeah. but, her, but, both, but most of these contracts are involved 360 uh, deals. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll give them a fuck ton of money, but <laughs> Uh, it's but, very expensive no, uh, bank uh, bank loan. But as a manager, Par, I can tell you that's sometimes the worst thing that can happen to an artist is they get that yeah. enormous check yeah, because yeah. the drive is like, you know, your drive just dies. It did the same thing with Robbie Williams a few uh, 10, 15 years ago when they gave him uh, too much money and he went out in the desert looking for uh, UFOs for after the tour. <laughs> <laughs> there is, uh, I, I take a few questions from the people on the, this uh, fan page of yours, if it's okay. Lynn Marie Swan, she's asking, apart from Sil, who is fabulous, by the way, is Jude working with any other new and upcoming artists on Fresh Coffee Records? No. I, in fact, I'm going to put the working with other artists thing on the back burner for a while. Um, I, I found that to be almost more difficult than working on myself. Um, with new artists comes new personalities, and some yep. of them, um, some of them adapt um, appropriately, mm. and others get way far ahead of themselves. Yeah, and it's a very hard thing to control. Yeah. And so uh, when you're dealing with artists, you know, you're talking about a very temperamental, very sensitive, very um, unmanageable group of people, often, oftentimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's better to be your, your own. 
I, I, I give my white flag. Yeah. And uh, that's why the focus on my own music. Yeah. And I'm even doing something a little different also in the world of meditation because I've been, I've been really into that since I was very young, okay. um, into uh, therapies that I, I think I came from a very challenging town of thinkers, you know, it was very blue collar, very like uh, simple minded. Mm -hmm. But along with that came a lot of fighting, a lot of anger, a lot of hostility, a lot of frustrations. Um, I came from that and mm -hmm. I had to really work my way into a, a higher level of consciousness. And I think uh, through many years of trying different religions, philosophies, uh, therapies, and, and uh, meditative practices, mm -hmm. um, I've developed something that I kind of, that doesn't exist that I wanted for me. So I've been developing something of my own and, uh, that's been really rewarding for me. I'm, I'm, I've been kept keeping it quiet. But, are you feeling uh, calm these days because of this? Are you? Well, because of the many years of, of practicing, it certainly made a better me mm -hmm. than, than I started out being. But it's something I had to work very hard on because, like I said, I didn't come from that. The world needs more of that these days in, the, mm -hmm. in this... Um, I believe you're right. And it's, um, era. I think that's why that's why my focus has shifted from, you know, after working with Sil for a while and then kind of having that uh, it blew up in my face a little bit and un, 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 just completely unexpected because we were right on target and she's was sensational and I wish her well. I really hope she does well. Um, mm -hmm. But I, it, it, it kind of came to a screeching halt and I did not expect it. And I just thought at this point, like, I'll focus on some things that really make me happy. And um, th this other field is just, it feels like there's a fresh new territory about it. Like it hasn't been, you know, everything in music is trampled on immediately. If something makes it, then every musician in the world wants to go in that direction. And then, oh, films are breaking music now. Oh God, everybody's like sending all their music to films and it's yeah. inundated. The Netflix, the Netflix syndrome. Yeah, you know, it's it can get really tiresome yeah. finding out there's a little crack in the window and then all the flies yeah. are covering the entire side of the building to try to get through that crack in the don't, window. Don't, don't tell me. Uh, so. This there feels more like a playground where no one realizes how good the playground is. No, it's true. Uh, there is a guy, and there is a lot of discussion of this uh, question. No girl, Kayla. Uh, she asks, any chance of live shows? And there is a lot of people saying uh, it won't be, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't like that, blah, blah, blah. But it's, I think it's better that you answer that question yourself. Uh, you play live here instead. There were bells on a hill, but I never heard them ringing. No, I never heard them at all until there was you. There were birds in the sky, but I never saw them ringing. No, I never saw them at all till there was you. And there was music, wonderful roses. They tell me in sweet, fragrant meadows of dawn and dew. There was love all around. But I never heard it singing. No, I never heard it at all. Till there was you. Let's see if I can remember this. There's a weird chord there. And there was 
music and wonderful roses they tell me in sweet fragrant meadows of dawn and dew there was love all around but i never heard it singing no i never heard it at all till there was you on this last bit to there was you there Kayla was the, that her name Kayla yes that's for you yeah the only live the, the only live gig we do this year and I have it myself here on scene <laughs> I hope I've now fulfilled my live performance quota for the year <laughs> I am not a traveling man, Kayla. I just don't care to travel. I never cared to be a carnival show. Um, and I do appreciate live music, but uh, if if Vegas were the template, I would gladly play live. Where yeah. you stayed in one place and people came to you, I would gladly do that. But to have to go to every town in America and in, 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 in every city in the, in the world, yeah. that's a certain breed. I, I didn't. I didn't get that gene to want to do that. You've done that, uh, and uh, I, I read some somewhere that you were really burned out. Is that the same word in English? Uh, after touring until eighty three, eighty four with the moon, and then you were signed, kind of burned. I had toured extensively from seventy eight until eighty uh, until about ninety five. Yeah. And that was enough. Yeah. I, I I, once I was done, I, I really I was done. Yeah. I'm I'm thinking about this uh, promotion idea that Aware Record had in the '90s, where they took their artists out on high schools, universities in the U.S. and had their artists building their brands, uh, like John Mayer did back then. You know, gigging themselves to success. Mm -hmm. It was a really good idea back then. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think well, there's it. Oh, sorry. It takes uh, a lot of commitment, and I really admire people who do it. Yeah. It's it's not something I've had for many years now. I've just I've been really enamored by making, trying to make better records, trying to write better songs. That really kind of excites me. Yeah. Whereas the other is more about like you've already written the song now you're going to go play it and you're going to play it tomorrow night and you're going to play it the night after that and then after that and then the crowds you know they cheer you and they make you feel really good about it that's nice but everything else about it is like what time is our lobby call what time is our bus call what time is our sound check what time is dinner what time is the show what time is the meet and greet yeah you gotta be fucking kidding me yeah. I, that's that's prison to me. That's prison. Yeah. That's not fun. So if you did the Celine Dion, the Celine Dion uh, thing in Las Vegas, it would be great for you. It would be amazing. Yeah. Even with Celine Dion, I, I would I would sing with Celine Dion. <laughs> you know what? Uh, my girlfriend played me a song. It's the Diane Warren song, yeah. uh, be, because you loved me. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I had ever really, you know, I'd never been in that kind of music, into that kind of music. I never really listened before. So she puts it on in the car and I'm listening to the song because yeah. you love me. And damn, if tears didn't start strolling down my, like I literally started crying. Because of her voice and because of her great song. And the song. Oh my God. Yeah. Both of those things. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely both. Yeah. She has hey. such an ID in her voice that this, something extra even if it's not my sort of music normally you know it's uh but she's amazing she's amazing. well so i came home and i found the song of her playing of, of her singing it on youtube yeah. and proceeded to watch it for the next three or four days just kind of incessantly yeah, yeah. trying to bring back that emotion again yeah speaking about celine uh I know that Aldo Nova, you know, the old 
AOR guy from Canada. He wrote a song that came on one of her big selling albums and it gets a lot of money to him. Uh, what is your biggest song except for your own stuff? Uh, do you have- a, I don't have big songs like that. Not I don't have, uh, on the ones I penned on my own, I don't have like that. The most successful uh, songs of, of that, uh, that I have been co-writer on were Lifehouse songs. It was, all right. But the, yeah. Travis Tritt did one of your uh, songs. Travis Tritt did Start the Car. Yeah. Billy Ray Cyrus did Time for Letting Go. Yeah. But there were quite a few country artists that cut my songs back in the late 90s and yeah. early 2000s. I think View from Third Street was one of those records that uh, a lot of people in the music business liked because it was engineered the way they wanted to do their records. Yeah. And you actually produced Clay Davidson back then. With Scott Hendricks, I did, yeah. Yeah. And um, did you have ideas, uh, any thoughts about moving down to Nashville and become a, uh, a country producer or country writer or whatever? I did. I've had many thoughts about it. I even bought a place there and I never moved into it. And um, yeah, now it feels a little passe. Everyone I knew in California is now there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the only one in California left. And I think yeah. I'm the only guy here. No, it's actually like that, uh, you know, Dan Huff and, uh, and Mark Spiro and, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't remember, I can't mention them all, but they're good. They're doing good stuff down there. Dennis, do you know Dan Huff? I'm not really. I mean, we've, we have spoken a few times. Um, he's doing well down there. Oh, he's great. Yeah. He another is. another another um, question from the group of people. They were really, really on here. I could tell you they wrote a lot of questions. Um, would he offer signed merchandise through his website? A question from Christopher Murphy. Yeah, I think... Uh... All of these um, ancillary forms of revenue, I, I've, I've been really not very good. I'm not a very good marketer. <laughs> you should have one to take care of it. That's it. I wish I did. All right. I really wish that I could walk around with a personal lawyer, a personal accountant, a personal marketer, mm -hmm. and just someone administrative minded because I'm really not that administrative minded. Yeah, you know, sitting there singing for Kayla, you know, that's what you should do. Yeah, that's kind of what I like to do the most. Todd Brown asks, how did Sass Jordan come to sing backup vocals on Start the Car? That really seemed that they had great chemistry. She was great, wasn't she? Yeah. I think great she just happened to be in the studio that day. I think she just happened to be in the studio. Okay. I stopped her in the hall and I went, Please I hear you sing. She's like, yeah, I did. Like, he has a really good I voice. That's well, a, I was like that. I would even ask the receptionists sometimes. Nothing. I mean, I knew Sass Jordan was a great singer. Uh, but, but if Sass Jordan hadn't been there, I might have very much asked the girl who was answering the phones. Because there are a couple of those on my records, too. Where? Uh, well, um, Uh, Life of Luxury on my first album was the receptionist singing backgrounds. Um, That's great. The, <laughs> uh, 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 sorry, she was the secretary. She was the secretary of Still, Russ. You know. Excuse me? Still really cool to have to do that. Yeah, I always, I always liked finding people. I love that. I still do. I love discovering people. I love, and the, unfortunately, in this day and age, you know, it's it, personalities are very interesting these days. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, there is a guy here, Tim Cochran, and he uh, helped me out on this one, please. And he's asking, ask Jude if he will release more demos from SoundCloud from songs we never heard from Third Street and other records. 
I've been asking for years, please. <laughs> There's quite a few on there. Um, yeah. I get into kicks, you know, generally speaking, if I find an old box or an old something with a bunch of old things that I go like, what am I gonna do with this? Oh, maybe I'll put it up on SoundCloud. And, but instead of uh, putting my time into that lately, I put my time into creating and making the finalizing the Kudaman record and the Coolerator record. Yeah. So that's kind of what I've been doing. Yeah, there, there you hear, hear Tim. It's better to hear new music and he can do that when he's getting tired and uh, older and he can put everything up for us then. And that, it's better that he's doing new stuff these days. Uh, well, I'm not much of, I'm not a very good look backer, you know. You know, are you listening to your old stuff? And uh, do you have a, have a night with a, a coffee and sitting down listening to your old stuff yourself? Never. Never ever? No. What about this one then? I like that record. I really like the song Falling Home because Falling Home says something I think pretty poignant. Um, falling Home is a metaphor for where I landed when I decided to stop resenting, okay. to stop hating some people. And, and show them forgiveness. And you, when you decide to forgive people you think you will never forgive, in my case, it was people that lied to me about my record deal. And when I ended up with no record deal and I had two kids and you know, then I was promised to, that I would get my record back by Ireland and they reneged on that. They didn't give me my record back. So I had really no way of getting an income. I was getting sued by a merchandise company. Um, I had so much resentment and I thought, man, this resentment is going to be what kills me if I don't get rid of it. And I had to learn to forgive. And when you forgive, you know, you don't go, oh, I'm going to just forget about that and move on. No, you truly bless them. You truly shine light around them. And you, you say, I understand they're human. They're doing what they see is right for them at yeah. this time, according to their enlightenment according to their intelligence this is who they are yeah. and you let them be who they are and you may not agree with it but you can certainly allow them passage to be who they are that was a big moment and so falling home is a song about that about where you land when yeah. you decide to forgive Pulled back and i realized that the reason just to finish that yeah. that story because i never told this the reason that that picture is on that cover was that mm -hmm. Or the, the, front. the front cover no. that was the day my father brought me my, my very first guitar okay. i can't imagine more anything more exciting than that yeah you look happy that's where forgiveness brought me back to um i'm right i'm writing uh, i'm reading the the lyrics while you were speaking and uh, i can understand your meaning of it right now forgiveness was the answer to going back to that child uh, or that that sort of innocence, and so that was a that was a very significant record, a therapeutic yeah. record for me. It's a very beautiful one. I, I I really love this album. I do. And that was a self made record. That was not a major label. That was no. a little Watertown label that I had started, very much like Fresh Coffee is to me now. And you play a lot of in instruments on here yourself. I did a lot of it in my room, in my bedroom. Can't you play some uh, few lines from Falling Home? Live? From the yeah. song Falling Home or the yeah. album? Or from, yeah, from something from this. I don't know that I can. I'd have to hear it. I'd have to hear a, of this. I would, I don't know that I, I, I name a title. My friend Stan, Breaking Wheels, Leave Me Breaking. Alone, Falling Home, Any Dark Day, Somewhere. I think any dark day was a whatever you've done. Whatever you've done, it can't be that bad. Not even a blame the heart that's been had. 
river runs free under cherry skies to take a sweet dream your words tonight put your mind at rest and your fears today I'm the one you can run to Ooh. any dark day yeah. yeah. Late for something else, so I have to wrap this up soon. Okay, let's uh, talk about the new album. That's the main reason we were supposed to talk. Um, it's, I reviewed the album. I love it, and I gave it... Uh, the best it can get because um, as always you, you nailed it and uh, and but it's uh, I don't I'm not as, as good obviously in English as you are uh, it's kind of shattered no so you're, you're <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of shattered in uh, in in the, in a positive way it's uh, some songs are more um, midwestern uh, kind of stuff and then you have this Pat, Patrick Leonard sort of Peter Gray Gabriel-esque songs on here and some uh, was it recorded in a long time this album is it is it that uh, no it's not that it's that if, if you listen to all my records I think they all have that you know in the very first record I had like lovers do which was for all intents and purposes I don't even know what key it's in, but like lovers do. It has straight ahead for like a real straight ahead rock beat, you know. Mm -hmm. And then it, I had uh, uh, I forgot how that went now. Man, uh, the walls that bend, very pop, very pop song. I mean, like, like a power pop song would do in the skinny tie days of the eighties, yeah, late seventies, early eighties. And then I had a crying Mary. I knew Mary. I mean, that's a country song. It's a great. She country. was a baby. Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> from the very onset, I. I couldn't just be a, I wanted to be an ACDC type thinking uh, artist where it's like, no, I do this. <laughs> because honestly, when you drill something home like that yeah. over and over, people tend to get it better. You know, you're one of a thousand artists yeah. and you need to drill something home for them to really say, I mm -hmm. get them. Yeah. No one ever really got me. And that's probably a big reason why, mm. but I'm okay with that. Yeah. No, it's, uh... I'm satisfied with that. It should be. It's uh, well, I, uh, you know, if you listen to the new album, uh, I mean, I've been listening to you since the, since the mid '80s, and uh, the, what, if I should pick out one of the best three or four songs ever with you is "The Dark." It's a uh, it's an amazing song. Uh, night with your headphones on. How do you come up with a song like that? It's uh, are you influenced? Generally, by that? generally I just uh, it's also lyric wise, it's very nice. It's uh, I love that. I yeah, love that. Yeah. Pink, Pink Floyd. Very reminiscent of a Pink Floyd, yeah. the way I cut the track, but also very reminiscent of something off that uh, Harvest Moon album. Yeah. That's a real deal. Classic. 
and then Pat came down and brought his synthesizers down. He knew I was into Pink Floyd mm -hmm. and uh, knew that's the type of thing I wanted to make. And man, you know, yeah. just keeping the drummer simple like Nick Mason would play and then yeah. Pat with all of his beautiful synth lines. That was a really, and, and singing about a topic that's of real interest to me again, you know, getting into the, the metaphysical, more meditative thing. Eckhart Tolle is a huge influence on me and then uh, has been since about 2006. Yeah. And just kind of trying to put into words uh, that magic bet in between and sometimes that mystery in between, excuse me, which is the, the, what they might call the God particle. What's between the space between you and I standing in a room together, that, that energy that we all live off of, that we all live inside of. Um, some would call it the dark when the lights are off and there's nothing. Well, that's what it really is because the light only illuminates, you know, the things we can see, but without that, it's, it's the dark. And so I use that as a metaphor really um, for the God particle. And there's great, and also some ominous things that come out of that God mm -hmm. particle. So I tried to just kind of go from there. We, we should do a, 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 an interview, you and I go through all the songs on the album sometime just talking about all the different songs and the ideas about it, but we don't have time now. So I should just ask you about the Cooler Rater album as well, Jude. Uh, you were born in 1961 and you're doing a cover album with songs from the 50s. How come? Well, I was in a band uh, from the time I was 12 years old, I've been in bands. And so we did all the typical stuff. You know, we did a whole lot of shaking going on and we did Good Golly Miss Molly, Rock Around the Clock and all, we did all that stuff, right? And then the 70s, uh, the, the Happy Days and the Fonzie was big and, you know, mm -hmm. Sean Anand Bowser would come out and it was malt shops and, and I got that real 70s. So, you know, then I ended up in, in Moon Martin's band and we're touring New York. And I'm in Gramercy Park and uh, the Gramercy Park Hotel. And I open up my, <clears throat> my window. I just get into my room. I'm a new, new young musician on tour. Very first tour of my life in New York City. Never been there before. Open up my blinds and there's uh, wire, fire escapes on other buildings and things. And I turn on what is a doo-wop station. They had a doo-wop station in New York in 1978. And I'm hearing music I had not really heard, but I'd heard it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, it was very familiar to me. Oh, what a night, Desiree by the charts that's on that record, Cooler Raider. Yeah. Um, things that I just identified with so much so that when the guys were all going out that evening, and this is, First time in New York, we're all going here tonight, dude. You want to come? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go get ready. And after I was in, in my room for an hour, you know, I got on the phone with the guys and I just said, "Hey, um, you guys go without me. I'm I I need to hang here." Yeah. I was so enraptured by this I music impressions. and and the scenery that was provided that it felt like I got to experience a past life. And so. And it, it also led me down the path of learning more doo-wop songs and realizing, man, the Bobby Sox malt shop thing of the Fonzie, all that, they, that really doesn't epitomize the greatness of what the 50s music really was. What, it was very powerful music. Have you, have you thought about doing this album for a long time? Yes. So uh, I started this record many years ago. But, okay. you know, being, being a manager, there just was never time to finish it. Okay. So... I finally could finish it and put it together. And I, and I call it volume one because I do plan on doing more. That's too fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should do that. Uh, you, you should, uh, you're going now. So uh, I just want to thank you. And, and yes. uh, I hope uh, that we can perhaps chat another time as well because it was really nice talking to you. Really and, enjoyed it too far anytime. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do it again. Yeah. and. Uh, to sum this up, uh, what's happening next in the uh, artist career? Is there an album coming out next year or two years? Do you have any plans? I don't know. 
No. I'm sure something. But no. right now I'm working on these meditation pieces. And so having a lot of fun with that. And letting us listening to Coupe de Main. Oh, how do you pronounce it? Coupe de Main? Yes. Coupe de Main. Coupe, Coupe de Main. De Main. Is anything. It's French. What does it mean, Coupe de Main? It's, it's a sneak attack. It's, it's, a, it's an attack when you don't know where you're being attacked. Okay. Very similar to what we're going through right now. Exactly. <laughs> we should we should not go into that too much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. And uh, take care. What are you going to do today? Are you going out? Uh, yes. I'm preparing. I have to prepare for uh, my 10 year anniversary that's coming up on. Oh, September. yeah, that's right. Be a gentle yeah. guy now. I appreciate it, Par. I'll talk to you again. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right. Bye Take now. care. Bye-bye.